W E F U N K. We funk. But I guess uh, while we're talking about comedy, uh, uh, one thing that I uh, uh, had a real cool experience back in the day, you telling me about some of the stories from uh, Pips Comedy Club. I was uh, just a kid from Jersey and uh, was not really familiar with the comedy history of Pips. And then uh, I think you were like one of the last uh, owners of it or something, right? But uh, I remember you telling me all about the whole, uh, you know, just comedy history. How about you, Rich? Are you familiar with Pips as like a New York uh, institution one of the oldest she, she clubs said, in the city? She said Bay, right? I still see a few T-shirts floating around once in a while, but uh, I was never there, but I know of it. Yeah, what was you the... You were never there? I'm surprised, Rich. I thought you had a... a... Never was at Pips. No, I never was there, but, you know, I know everybody, there, you know, talks about it. I see I seen a couple T-shirts. I think Gallo had one. I know Otto had one. I forgot who else just had one. Otto seems like a Pips guy. What was the deal with Pips, oh. Joe, though, Joe? You want to maybe uh, tell some of the no geniuses from Jersey that are listening about uh, about Pips of Brooklyn? Pips? I, I was one of the last guys to really have the Pips experience. And I think that that experience was, uh, it was like an apprenticeship at a really fucked up club. Um you know, I en- I worked in the kitchen. I ended up living in the apartment above Pips. Okay, and you had nice. to walk through the club to get up there. <laughs> and in the room where I lived, like uh, Rodney Dangerfield, um, Lenny Bruce, Joan Rivers, uh, David Brenner, like the list is endless. The comics who spent time up there before their show or whatever or hung out. The family um, that owned it, uh, the Schultz family, there was a very special guy there named George the Ear Schultz, and they called him the Ear because he could hear comedy and change what seemed to be innocuous details and fix jokes like uh, it was okay, described as a supernatural power that, you know, like David Brenner told me once that he had a joke where he was talking about dead bodies and... Um, you could have X amount of dead bodies and nobody would notice, right? And the joke wasn't working. <clears throat> and George said to him, change the number to like 44 or 444. And he was like, George, the joke isn't working. It's a three minute bit. He said, just do it. <laughs> so he said he got on stage and he did it and it fixed the whole joke that it all worked for whatever reason. And he could never understand why. And he more so couldn't understand how George could understand that that would. Yeah, yeah. Just the little differences that it'll make it. Now, was George a comedian himself, George the Ear? Or was he just worked at the club and was like a, uh, you know, the booker, uh, the guy that ran the club? All of the above, yes. George was a comic, and he performed under the name Georgie Starr. He had children. uh, He had sons, Seth and Marty. And after that happened, he had to settle down. So he bought a small hippie coffee house on Sheepshead Bay and started doing kind of vaudeville shows. Oh, um, sick. Ro- Robert Guillaume of Benson fame used to hang out upstairs, and if somebody bombed, he would come down and sing in Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. <laughs> yes. That was the Apollo uh, clown and- that would hook him off, was a uh, guy running in and singing him off in Yiddish. <laughs> Yes, he would just come out, Pop up from drop there. one in Yiddish, drop the mic, and they would be ready for comedy again. Yes, that was his speciality. That's great. Fuck yeah. Andy Kaufman performed there for Ice Cream Sundays. We're at the, uh, at the at the coffee shop? Be- yes, before they were famous. Everything you've ever seen, uh, the video of Andy Kaufman playing the bongos, which Jim Carrey recreated in Man on the Moon. That was shot by Seth. Okay, wow. The the son? The son of George Schultz, who... He and George Schultz was, was like, uh, he was, the, was he the guy that gave Rodney the name Rodney? Like, of course, the famous story, Rodney was like a, you know, fledgling comic, then quit, then was like a, you know, aluminum siding salesman or whatever it was, then came back yes. to comedy. And wasn't it the guy from Pips that gave him the name and all and the whole... No, no, you're, you're, you're it's... Uh, the name Rodney Dangerfield, if I understand correctly, was a throwaway line said by Jack Parr on The Tonight Show. 
And okay. they were saying it was in the context of there was a list of party guests. <clears throat> and they were saying, here's all the people we want. They're like, well, who else? And he said, Rodney Dangerfield. And it got a big laugh. Rodney Dangerfield's real name was Jacob Cohen. And he then became Rodney Dangerfield. But what George did for Rodney was he allowed him to use the hook, no respect. George had a character he did when he was on the road. And he said uh, it was uh, like a low-level mafia guy. And he'd be like, I don't get any respect. And (laughs) uh, Jacob Cohen at the time was able to see that that was bigger than the sum of its parts in the way that George could fix a joke. He could recognize that that wasn't just a throwaway line. It was an identity he could ride for 50 years. (laughs) It was, yeah, one of the most iconic couple of words in all of comedy, you know? I think it's arguably the most iconic catchphrase. Yeah, Yeah, catchphrase, I'd say, actually. Yeah, probably, you know? Maybe not gimmick is is total, but uh, uh, that's awesome, though. It's and it's then, like, I've heard Dice talk character. a lot about it, so it was even kind of throughout the generations of, you know, throughout the 70s, because, of course, it was like, you know, Larry David and uh, uh, Richard Lewis have talked about it and all, but then Dice and uh, some of the, you know, uh, younger generations. Well, look, there's, I have to say this about Pips, and that's uh, when I got there, most of that history was done. It was um, that all the people like Richard Lewis and... None of them came back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you never saw yeah. them again. They all came back for the going away documentary about how sad it was that it's gone, but none of them fucking came back there before it was uh, when it was still around. Well, here's the deal with Pips. In the end, um, it was a crazy place at the end of the earth, and it was full of fucking lunatics and misfits. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it, and that was really the time I was there for it. And don't get me wrong, there were incredibly funny people, um, but not, they weren't famous. Famous people did not come back there. Jackie Mason would perform there, but he did extraordinarily well there. Yeah, you yeah. know, he could charge 50 or $75 a ticket at that time <laughs> and sell the place out every show and everybody was happy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was part of uh, a, a pilot they shot there called Last Laugh at Pips. And there were a lot of famous people who showed up for that. For example, Big Pussy is in it and Paulie Walnuts. Ray Garvey, it, it's hard to talk about Pips without mentioning Ray. And he'd love to hear that sentence, God bless him. <laughs> uh, Ray, at that time, Ray was an interesting character. He's a guy who worked the door there and eventually bought the place. And um, he was tight with Woody Allen. He was in six of Woody Allen's films. He, he has some bit parts uh, that he does. He's, he's a good actor. Nice. He also had a moment on The Sopranos. He's the security guard who says to Livia Soprano, hey, you want to come with me? And <clears throat> in the time that I was there, Ray Garvey was the only person really connected with show business that had any relevance at that time. And he brought all these people there for last five Okay, so- so like Colin It wasn't Wayne, even just the name of Pussy. Pips, it was uh, more a connection with Ray Garvey that got him back. Well, it's it's always that, right? There's always that I go there to see, you know, whether it was Lucian back in the day at the comic strip or um Ray Garvey at Pips or uh you know, maybe you go see Esty at the cellar. There's always a person who is kind of the uh the personality associated with uh, the place. Like Mitzi Shore out in a comedy store in California. Precisely right. And without those people, these places don't exist. And that's been proven. Yeah. No, that's true. The other thing that you said that's definitely true, but you really do need a good crowd and a good kind of culture around the comedy club to keep it to keep it going. And a place like Sheep's Head Bay, which is fucking <laughs> way out in the middle of nowhere, like you said, I think on the, the queue line or whatever. I was there one time for the World Cup a couple years ago. I was going to like uh, a cultural places for the World Cup matches. 
So I went to uh, uh, Sheepshead Bay for a Russian World Cup matchup, and I watched in this place that was like the fucking uh, uh, Inglorious Bastards place. It was down in this basement. The ceiling was like eight feet high. Fucking Russians packed out the balls going ape shit in this place, dude. They just they kicked us out of a table that we were sitting at. So just like, they're like, oh, no, you, like, you guys have to go. These guys had a, red, a reservation. And just two Russian guys sat down, and we had to stand and watch the game. I wasn't asking any fucking questions. I wasn't complaining with these two fucking <laughs> roosters. Skis in the middle of uh, Brooklyn for the World Cup match, but but it's definitely a trek to get out there and and uh, you know not necessarily the comedy comedy world, you know. Hey, let me say what you're trying to. It's uh, <laughs> it's not a safe place for stand up comedy anymore. Bad things can happen to you for having ideas that they disapprove of. And that's always been the case with Sheepshead Bay and Pips. If, if uh, Amongst the comedians, they called it the White Apollo. But okay. the Apollo, they <laughs> must just boo you. At Pips, you might get your fucking ass kicked <laughs> as well. It, it really was a, a special, but a very crazy place. And that's the thing that I think people have a hard time putting their finger on. I have a lot of really great stories about Pips that show that. Um, one of which is uh, there was a guy named Richie Triola who. Hello. Uh, yeah, Richie Triola. If if I were to say what his claim to fame is, he's the guy who took Adam Sandler on his first road gig. Okay, nice. Yeah, it's a big, uh, it's a big claim to fame. That should get you laid in a bar, you'd hope, you know. Well, I know about it. He mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he was on stage once there, and the kitchen caught on fire. And while the kitchen was on fire, Marty said to Seth, the kitchen's on fire. And he said, all right, go tell him to stretch. I <laughs> 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 uh, went out like, hey, because <laughs> Seth was supposed to go up. I've got to take care of, I've got to put out a fire in the back, make sure <laughs> yeah. That's stage, get the crowd great. hot. <laughs> Colin Quinn, the first night he was ever in, I hope he doesn't, he won't give shit. This is a good story. The first night Colin Quinn ever went to Pips, it was a very big and legitimate club. It was someplace where it, it was, um, you know, famous people were there. The people on TV went to Pips. This is where they performed. And he was starting out as a comic. And he went down there for like Wednesday night, which is audition night. And uh, he has, he, he says he places his hand on the door. And on the door, there is this like scrawled note. It says, Joey Facamato will not be appearing at Pips tonight. Oh. And he's like, what the fuck is this? But he doesn't think anything of it. He opens the door, he comes in, and he's talking to Seth, and he's like, you know, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm here, I want to perform. He says, it's going okay. And they're like, you know, it's a big deal to him. He wants to perform there. And he says, all of a sudden, the door opens up, and a bunch of tattooed skinheads from Avenue X come in and they just start picking up chairs and they're winging chairs and they're like, all right, everybody get the fuck out. Show's outside. So they're like, what? So Colin says, he has this moment where he realizes if he, you know, he stands up with Seth like, hey, fuck you guys. He's in. And he does and it works. And Seth's like, yeah, you know, you're all right. You come back next week. You got Wednesday. balls. You got balls, kid. You can stay. You got balls, kid. I'm putting you on Friday. <laughs> it's his first spot there. He says, but that's not even the weird part. The weird part is... Skinheads from Avenue X were fucking... They were coming in all the time. Sure. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> he goes outside and there's Joey Facamato on the back of a flatbed truck with a mic... And two speakers. <laughs> <laughs> He's come back. Fuck you, bitch. I got a club right outside the yeah. club. No shit. I don't need to be in there. Yeah. Got... And he's doing his act. And uh, it turns out that Joey Facamato went on stage a week earlier, was telling stories. Somebody said something, he punched somebody. They said, you can't come back. Now it's Joey Facamato's revenge. Yeah. He's outside. <laughs> yeah. Joey so, Facamato's uh, rallying skinheads outside. To, uh... <laughs> yeah, I love this story. I've told it 
a hundred times in the context of people asking me about pips. But the best part of it is, and it's it's what Colin said about it. He goes, yeah. He says, does that? Even, he says, what really bothered me is half the people left. Like this is uncomfortable. He said, the other half of the crowd were like, ha ha ha. Oh shit! <laughs> the other guys, yeah, the other half, really related to the bit, you know. They yeah. Really... What, to give you an idea, uh, I'm sorry. I'll tell you one more story, and then I'll shut the fuck up. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, we could listen to him all night. We'll have to get you on another time to uh, tell some more Pip stories, but definitely give us one more. I, I, the first night I went there, a comedian. I don't remember who. I'm gonna give you the abridged version of this, but. A comedian, I don't remember who, he he hired me to do a guest spot. It was the first time I was ever there. I was doing comedy about four or five years. It was just enough to be good enough to be on the show, but not good enough to be paid. Uh, <laughs> on a professional show. Yeah, yeah. On a professional show. I was I yeah, just yeah, for sure. good enough where I wouldn't embarrass anybody. <laughs> Uh, so this guy was teaching a class, and the graduation was six minutes, and I was the ringer. So uh, all these people go up, uh, and they're, you know, they're okay. They're, you know, six months in, they're doing those jokes. I live in a studio apartment. Uh, did I shut off the stove? Yes. You know, they're doing those jokes. Right. So, uh, I think I did that one. Was that, uh, was that one of mine? I think. <laughs> I've seen it done by 15 different comics. It's just part of being a comic yeah, in a yeah. studio apartment. You eventually <laughs> arrive there until yeah. somebody tells you about the guy who's It's really a parallel thinking kind ago. of situation. With So uh, the, this guy gets up, right? First of all, a guy comes up to me, and he's got a face that, like, if you grew up in a regular neighborhood, sometimes you could see somebody, and by their face, you're like, oh, that's an oflanity. Because yeah. the whole family has one fucking face. <laughs> yeah, the whole fucking family shares. So this guy walks up, and I know who he is, and uh, I know what family he's from. And he's like, hey. And I'm with this girl. It's like, who's the whoa? And I'm like, whoa. You know, I haven't even met the guy. And I'm talking to a girl, and I'm broke, and I'm trying to get with her. Turns out he's the brother of a guy I used to drink with 10 years ago that we called the Dirty Michael J. Fox. <laughs> the Dirty Michael J. Fox gets on stage, and he this is the most uncomfortable thing I've ever seen. I'm doing stand-up comedy 23 years now. This is the worst thing I've ever... The most <laughs> uncomfortable. He gets up, and he goes through the crowd, and he starts at the first seat, and he goes, Hey, you, fat lady. I know you. I fucked you in the ass. He goes through the entire club at every seat except for these two old people. He skips them, and everybody's grateful for it. <laughs> After he finishes that, he starts again, but he makes it worse. He goes, hey, you fat lady with the blonde hair and the black roots. He makes it worse by one note for everybody. <laughs> but now he gets to... The old people. <laughs> you let him go the first round. Uh... Them. And you can feel it. And nobody wants it. And there's, I swear <laughs> to God, the, you can hear it in the crowd. You start hearing people go, oh, no. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear this, oh, this murmur of, please, don't, whatever, don't, not the old people. Huh? And he goes, hey, everybody knows I fucked her in the ass. And goes, oh, oh. He, goes, he goes, but what you don't know is I fucked him in the ass and I made him wipe the shit off my dick with the house keys. Good night. And he runs off to with his hands above his head like he has scored the winning touchdown. <laughs> hands start to come out of the crowd to get him. That that's it. There's gonna be physical violence. You know how I said you yeah, could yeah. get your ass kicked? It's about to happen. He's gone too far. He crossed that line in Sheep's head bed. Yeah, so they grab him, he starts getting pulled out into the street, punches are being thrown out of the crowd. The girl I was talking to, she's part of the scrum. I can see her swinging. 
Ray Gaudry looks at me and goes, hey, what are you doing Friday night? And I go, I'm working here. And he goes, yeah, be here at eight. And I was booked while there was a fist fight <laughs> in the room going on. And I was never happier in my life. But I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. Every, now that's a, that's an owner that's in control of the situation right there, you know. He never moved. You were on Friday. <laughs> his view was, hey, he didn't have to say that to the old guy. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, my question is, whatever happened to Dirty Michael J. Fox? I should have had the sense to be like, no, nah, you know, thank you. Other clubs will want me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just should show up for the show at that point. I mean, fuck, you're not going to have a more entertaining uh, Friday night than that. But <laughs> yeah, He goes, that guy's going to need an opener next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my question is, whatever happened to the dirty Michael J. Fox? I'd like, is the story, and, and then that person went on to be... Parkinson's. Dirty Michael J. Fox Jr. His brother was the Dirty Michael J. Fox, and we called him that because he looked a lot like Michael J. Fox, but he was furiously dirty. You could smell Was that him. his act? Like every time he would just go on and try to incite the. A... <laughs> he wasn't I a never regular. Saw him again. That's hilarious. An act like that might get old, you know, but. <laughs> Big Al! W E F U N K. We funk. <laughs>